the, the massacre that's going on in Palestine right now as mm -hmm. Israel bombs all of Gaza and Rafa, more and more Americans are resisting the narrative that Israel is on the right side in regards to this issue. Has Israel lost the information war, in your opinion? Absolutely. And I think a lot of people would agree that Israel has lost the information war. Israel has lost the uh, pers the public and the public's trust and perception. They will not recuperate from that thanks to social media, thanks to the fact that we are seeing videos from many Palestinians and people who have died, who have sent what has been happening, thanks to that. If it was 10 years ago, it wouldn't be the same because technology has developed in a way that has allowed us to see in real time what this ethnic cleansing, what this genocide is by the Zionist Israeli project. And what, what we're seeing, it cannot be unseen. The, the bodies of children, of infants, of women, of of everybody, of men as well as as especially young people. The fact that uh, Palestinians died trying to get flour, uh, that will never be forgotten. The fact that Al Shifa Hospital, a hospital, was bombed into oblivion. The actual incubator babies that were left and and have been found deceased, and and their bones that were left. The these stories are not just you know, stories that have been told by third parties. We have seen them in the images every single day since October 7th. And we have also seen in a jarring way, the lies from the State Department, the protection of Israel by uh, Israelis and, and Zionists in the United States. All right. So I have with me today my guest, Fiorella Isabel. She is a journalist and political commentator. And... I love, I'm loving the jacket, by the way, but good to see you as well it's here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. So last time we talked, we talked about, you know, your your uh, development and how you got to where you're at today as far as your journalism. And now I just want to get into the things that are going on and your thoughts about what's going on from your perspective. Uh, one of the things that I actually wanted to start off with was that you now live in Moscow and Russia just recently had its recent elections. I wanted to get your, your perspective of the differences you noticed there that you haven't seen in the United States, if you can give us that kind of perspective from 30,000 feet. Right, so uh, the elections here are, they have similarities and differences. Uh, the similarities I would say is there is more than one day um, this is just new. Uh, it didn't. They didn't do this before. They had uh, some time to vote uh, via online, um, but it was in, done entirely with a blockchain-based type of, of uh, electronic system, which is uh, very difficult to hack. I'm not saying any internet system is isn't uh, open to hacking. It is. But this particular system is like a blockchain-based type of system. Also, they use uh, actual Russian hackers themselves to kind of oversee. But you have to sign up ahead of time if you want to vote uh, online from home. You can also sign up to vote in the in Moscow, particularly, which is the capital. You can use the uh, a new electronic voting system, which is basically, it's the same thing we see in California. It's just a computer or in, in other places now you go and you pick your choice for president and you um, get a, a confirmation that your vote has been counted. And then you, you show up at the polling station. You do need an ID. You do need a, um, it's a passport. They have, their ID is a Russian passport, which they can use to travel anyway inside of Russia, anywhere, because it's huge. Russia's huge. So they use a passport. They don't use like a uh, driver's license ID. That's a separate thing. Um, so you need that and they look you up on the database and then you go in. Or if you wanted to use pen and paper, you also have that option of doing that. And then the votes are tallied immediately and you get a result. The official, uh, they're tallied immediately, but the official result might take a few days 
but uh, they'll t announce a winner, which is what happened. And so a lot of people have questioned Russia's elections, um, especially in the United States. They said, oh, you know, Putin, he's a dictator. He's being reelected all the time. But I have to remind everybody that in the United States, we didn't have term limits for the presidency. FDR would have kept winning. And that's why they put in these term limits. Now, you can argue that it's good, that it's bad. But what I can say is that a lot of socialists and communist countries don't have term limits. Um, and in a way, it's worked to their benefit because I would say that, for example, if you're a country like Cuba that has had had a popular leader in Fidel Castro, he was getting reelected by popularity. You have the vulnerability of having a Western-backed candidate try to come in and and or be influenced uh, a candidate be influenced by the west and try to overthrow the government the same thing we saw in russia via navalny and those attempts to try to uh fund navalny directly from the state department and the intelligence apparatus receive funding to try to overthrow the government of russia we've seen this in nicaragua as well where i've been several times and uh, daniel ortega keeps getting reelected which is why they say he's a dictator, but he keeps winning. And again, they go after candidates who are funded directly by the United States, which the United States would do as well. We have the Uhura movement, the Uhura group getting a jail time because somebody allegedly, right, because of, of many allegations, but among them is that they had ties to Russia. So these are excuses. And what I saw, especially in the new territories, in the Donbass, uh, in Lugansk, in, in Donetsk, um, and in other territories, you basically saw Putin win by a higher margin. He won by 87% of the vote. But what's important to note here isn't how high he won by, but how many people actually participate overall in the country. It was close to 70% of the population participated in the elections. We don't have those numbers. We can only dream of those numbers. So that tells you uh, how involved people are in their political process. Of course, they're going through a war issue right now, which I think will ramp up participation one way or another. But, in, but it is also the fact that in the territories, for example, where you vote by pen and paper, they don't have any of the machines there. Uh, Putin won by a larger number. He won by in the 90s of the percentage wise, which is why so many people try to question the elections the same way they did with uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, that there's no way this could be a possibility. Now, even if you did believe that, first of all, it's none of the United States' business when we have dismal elections and the public has uh, in the United States lost the confidence in elections, understandably so. We keep third parties out. We have a two-party system, which we know is two wings of the same bird. We don't have an ability to have a, a viable third-party option or viable independent options. There are like several parties in Russia, and there's a communist party, and the communist party is the second uh, largest party. It is the most. It's the second most powerful. And uh, the current president, Putin, is not part of any party at the moment. Uh, he left the party that he was in. So technically, Russia has a, a president that is independent of any party, which is really interesting and something that would be unheard of in the United States. So, yeah, there are similarities, but there are obviously many differences. And I, I like the difference that in spite of, you know, there's new parties coming in and different things going on, that the Communist Party is still a substantial influence uh, in Russia. And um, and the Communist Party is the one that actually wanted to go into Donbass earlier to protect this, the Russian ethnic uh, citizens that were getting killed by actual neo-Nazis. And, um, you know, that, that was something that I think a lot of people uh, don't really know about. And yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty good, interesting to see the different dynamics. Yeah, and, and just to point out what you were saying earlier, I want to show the Electoral College maps of two uh, presidents. So, because uh, everybody talks about, oh my gosh, well, if somebody sweeps that much of the electorate, it is, you know, uh, it, it's got to be a dictatorship. Was it a dictatorship when Ronald Reagan won in 1980? Was that a dictatorship? 
I don't think so, but <laughs> I mean, because it could be. Yeah. Are you? I mean, look at look at that sea of red, right? Um, you, you know, want, since you brought this up, votes. I, I just want to point something out too. Since you brought this up, uh, this is debatable for people. The electoral college issue in mm -hmm. Russia, they have direct. Uh, voting. So you vote, your vote counts for or against a, a candidate, whatever that candidate is, right? Um, in the United States, we have the Electoral College. We elect delegates and superdelegates. And that yeah. is not direct democracy. And that also diminishes yeah. our uh, ability to have a say in who is elected. So that's a, another huge difference because we don't feel like our vote counts. We've seen what happened with Bernie Sanders in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. We've seen everything that happened after that in the last two elections and the way that the third parties have just been completely pushed away. It just shows that we don't really have the ability to choose the president. We, see, we saw what Barack Obama did as well in 2020 um, in asking all of the other candidates to drop out. And we don't have a candidate at this point in uh, the Democratic Party that ran as a Democrat that is actually fighting for people. And you could even say that the third party candidates are also weak. And I know you wanted to talk about them as well. But for me, it's like, I'm not at the point where I believe electoralism is going to save the United States um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to hold out, hold it against people like, you know, my, my co-host Pasta who says, well, we need to vote. We can't let it take them, take that away from us. We need to support other candidates. But look, I, for me, it's, it, it, I don't see that, that we have fair elections. They're not going to let somebody that's going to challenge the establishment in, in any way, shape or form. I think the power has to come through uh, outside means through a, a peop the people demanding it. And I think the United States is headed in that direction, unfortunately, because of the uh, the fall that we're experiencing in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And just wanted to share this as well. This is just the other side of the spectrum that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, so of course I shared, uh, it was Ronald Reagan in 1980. This is the 1932 election for Franklin Roosevelt look at how much he won uh and this is just swings in the, uh, the complete opposite direction so when people talk about oh my god somebody like vladimir putin winning that much of the vote it's like it's not out of the realm of possibility that people actually just like the leader that they already have right yeah it's not and i just want to say uh also putin uh he when he came into power, Russia was uh, really in a different state. And I have friends who have come back to Russia after leaving when they left like at five or six years old and they've returned and they are like, wow, this is a completely different country. Not saying he did this all on his own, but a lot of people here view him as somebody that tried to, uh, did the best he could in terms of modernizing Russia to what it, what it is today. And one of the things that people don't like to talk about is that Russia still has many elements of the Soviet Union that make it a successful country, at least right now on the rise. You have the uh, university that's uh, practically free. Uh, people don't go in debt for that. You have people that home, uh, own homes, home ownership is high. Why? Because of Soviet Union, uh, because people were given homes and they have passed down these homes from generations. Most people I know who are from Russia do not pay rent. They don't have to if they don't want to. And that is something that I think gives people the freedom to not have debt. Credit borrowing is not as common here as well as it is in the United States because people live within their means as well. Now, the, the issue of transportation, there are trains who built them. Stalin and um, these the train system was is, is so effective here in Moscow it, all over Russia in general they have a wonderful train system but it is ex most effective in Moscow it is clean it is efficient if you miss a train less than a minute later 30 seconds to 45 seconds later there's another one coming and that's how it works and you can get around via taxi there's bicycles there's scooters all these things yeah but the train system the subway the metro is the most effective and then you have healthcare. if uh you don't have a job the state pays for your health 
if you uh, have a job, your employer pays. You don't get it taken out of your paycheck. Your em employer pays your health care. And if you, uh, for example, want a different doctor that's not in your uh, health care system, you're not refused treatment. You simply pay more of a, of a fee uh, if you want a different doctor. But it's not like it's that much. And so I, I, I really, you know, I had a friend who had a health issue and they took the ambulance and the ambulance was completely free. This is something that's a luxury in the United States where we all, our people are taking Ubers because they don't want to pay the $10,000 it costs to get an ambulance. And I know you know this because you have a health issue. And yeah. this is something that you would think, wow, if a country that we are told is a gas station with nuclear weapons, it's so backward and there's a dictatorship and all of these things. Well, they have health care. They have, a, you know, a, a education. They have public transportation. These are things, basic things that we don't have in the United States, so it's the, the greatest country in the world. So why is that possible then for Russia, who came from the Cold War, who came after the fall of the Soviet Union and was in a very dire position to achieve that in a matter of decades, whereas we are just losing. We, our infrastructure is crumbling. The trains are derailing. The, everything is, is getting blown up. We are seeing the, the bridges fall, right? And and this is this is just a, a symbolic. I don't think it's there's a conspiracy behind the bridge, by the way. I think it's just everything is... Is, makes itself go uh, in a more chaotic manner because our infrastructure is already bad to begin with. So everything is just sort of falling apart. Yeah, and, and I, just just to uh, kind of put a pin on what you said, because I, I wasn't expecting to go in this direction, but I, I'm actually very interested in this. It sounds like Russia is more of that thriving social democracy that a lot of progressives actually champion but they never ever talk about Russia, right? Right. Yeah, and it's because you know uh, they're they're more uh, conservative in in some social aspects. For example, drugs here are not legal uh, in terms of marijuana and such. And like you know, the younger populations don't agree with that. This is something that Russia is going to have to grapple with. But what I go back to is you know that's their prerogative. That's up for the people of Russia to decide. For the people of Russia to to decide what things will look like going forward. It is still not a country, though, uh, for example, that is ruled by a religion. Uh, there is like a strong uh, sentiment of uh, or orthodoxy, Russian Orthodox Church, but it's not like you sit there and have to pray at, at any school or anything. And in fact, most people don't even go to church. It's just a sector of the population. And so when you hear um, that, you know, Russia is just super conservative. It's crazy. I think, I think that's just the older, maybe certain sectors of the population. Um, if you recall during the, the Soviet Union, they weren't fond of the church either. So there's kind of those different elements that all exist there. And I think that's going to be something that they'll develop to their own pace. We can't be here and dictate you know, in the United States say we need Russia to be this and that while we, our president and our military and our entire government is supporting genocide in Gaza. So I, again, there's just different elements that are used to try to, you know, d dismiss uh, Russia as a country. You know, I'm not saying I agree with everything that every single Russian politician says or does, but what I do think is that they are a sovereign country and a sovereign people, and they have the right to decide for themselves what, what they should or shouldn't do. And I would say that Russia is kind of behind on these social issues in terms of like where we were a few decades ago, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to push our our, our own beliefs on that. And that's kind of how I look at it. Like, okay, I see, I see where, you know, the economics of things is strong. Uh, I see that there's a lot of those values that remain from the Soviet Union, what you call, you know, social democracy, because Russia is a capitalist country. There is capitalism, but there are also a lot of things controlled by the state, which is still uh, a Soviet type of structure. So there's an interesting mixture there. And I would say it's, a mixed type of economy with uh, social safety nets uh, that uh, far exceed what we have in the United States. 
Understood. Thank you so very much. Now, I, my next question I wanted to ask you, and sorry, I deviated a little bit, but that was just some interesting information that you were giving. But my next question is, we now have basically a rematch of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, which many people's eyes are on. But recently, RFK Jr. announced his VP, who is for all intents and purposes, a Democrat, a wealthy Democrat. Now, her name is Nicole Shanahan. What are your thoughts on this pick? And are the optics looking favorable or unfavorable for RFK Jr.? Well, um, I think the optics have been unfavorable for him since he went on a rampage in supporting Israel and hanging out with Rabbi Shmuley and pretty much saying how, you know, he thinks Palestinians and Hamas, the, the same type of rhetoric that we see coming from the U.S. State Department, from Zionists. So that was a one one thing that I think the most really undid his campaign for a lot of people. The second thing is picking a VP that is an unknown and is a Democrat is not going to really uh, play up to the branding he put out as being an anti-establishment independent candidate because his foreign policy, beside what he says about Ukraine, which he says he would, you know, end the war in Ukraine and all, all of that is still pro-Zionist, is still going to push buttons with Iran and the Middle East. He's pretty much uh, a terrible on immigration in, in Latin America. Once again, using the whole same trope of, you know, the invasion of, of, of cartels and that sort of thing. And so foreign policy wise, he seems to be right on the track with Democrats. And then he puts in a VP that has no experience, doesn't have any name recognition, which is superficial, but it matters when you look at the election uh, pr process. And she um, is extremely wealthy. So that doesn't signal to people that he's going to try to go outside of the establishment. And let's be honest, RFK comes from the establishment. He has uh, Hollywood and CIA connections within his family, within, uh, I think, his daughter-in-law uh, as well. And at the end of the day, you know, I think he's trying to get in there whatever way he can, but I, I don't see how that is a viable option if you're really trying to shake things up. And people can say, well, he's scared. He's scared of the Israeli lobby. He's scared of APAC. He's scared that he will be assassinated like his father and his uncle. Well, okay. But again, then if, if you're scared, and I mean, understandably, you might be um, in U.S. politics as to what could potentially happen, you shouldn't be in politics because otherwise you're just making people lose their time, waste their time. And some people, uh, I, I think, need to stop putting hope in a savior, whether it's RFK, whether it's somebody else, whether it was Bernie Sanders, you know, and we were all there for Bernie Sanders. We all thought, hey, maybe perhaps this guy is going to break through and save us all and in a way, you know, challenge the establishment with all his movement. And look how that turned out. And we have, you know, Bernie Sanders still both siding the Israel-Palestinian uh, issue, which is a genocide recognized by the majority of the world, except the United States and its proxies. So at the end of the day, I don't really think that RFK is a viable or serious candidate at this point. I think some Americans are under the illusion that he could be. I think especially because of the COVID, his challenging of the COVID uh, and what happened in the treatments and, and everything else because of that. I think some people only focused on that and ignored literally everything else, which I think is a fallacy. Um, but, you know, I, I honestly just, I think his candidacy really ended with the whole Shmuley thing and just hanging out with a rabbi and making a fool of himself. How is that being anti-imperialist when there's a genocide happening? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in the same vein, uh, my next question was RFK Jr. was challenged by a debate by Dr. Jill Stein recently, but Mr. Kennedy chose to decline the debate and it's actually shared here by dr jill stein uh she says we heard from rfk jr's campaign manager he doesn't want to debate me on gaza seems he doesn't want to explain how he's anti-war while he supports israel committing genocide and start and trying to start a world war three on our dime uh so basically uh she said hey let's have a debate and he said no 
my question is, uh, what are your thoughts on him declining this? Because this looks really bad. Yeah. At least to me, it's like she's calling him out, and he said, "Yeah, nah." Yeah. Um, so I think that it was smart of her to try to debate him because this shows his hypocrisy. This shows that he's not really serious about going after the empire because he himself has been excluded from debates. So if he's actually trying to be this guy that's going to break the mold and actually offer people something different than what the Democrats or the Republicans are offering, he would walk the walk and actually have a debate with her and with anybody else that is challenging him. And the public would benefit from that because yeah. the public would see, okay, well, this is supposed to be an independent candidate that's going to be uh, an anti-imperialist of sorts, right? And then you have Jill Stein, who is also an independent or a Green Party candidate. And she is obviously critical of uh, Israel. And this is what the difference of these candidates. And this is what we can see. But him saying no to that just basically shows that he is afraid of being challenged because he knows that he's going to look bad. And his Whoever is managing his campaign at this point, to me, screams establishment based on everything we've seen um, from him. And he seems to me like at this point, controlled opposition. Um, and I think for a long time, that's what's unfortunately been the case. And um, I, I think we're going to uh, see more of that. We're going to see more of him just pivot. He has uh, also refused to really condemn Joe Biden to uh, the degree that's needed. He's actually refused to really talk negatively in a way, which I think people are past that point of political uh, politeness uh, and so-called decency when we have what's happening. We're on the brink of World War III. I am not exaggerating. We're on the brink of nuclear catastrophe. Our country is starting, uh, is trying to start a war with Russia via NATO. Uh, threatening uh, Europe is threatening to send actual troops. We have the uh, we have Israel attacking Iran's embassy, which is completely a violation of so many things, including the Vienna Convention, international law, and then we also have the ramping up against China. And so, at any point in the world that that I just mentioned, you could see a potential escalation into a global conflict. And yet, you know. We don't have anybody there that's actually challenging to a degree uh, in in our in our political government, and then you have the pot the potential th is really showing you that he's just all talk. He's not really going to challenge the system. Yeah, I, I don't think so. And this actually leads into one of my next questions, and this is in regards to what's going on uh, the the. I don't even want to say conflict. Uh, the, the, the massacre that's going on in Palestine right now is mm -hmm. Israel bombs all of Gaza and Rafa. More and more Americans are resisting the narrative that Israel is on the right side in regards to this issue. Has Israel lost the information war, in your opinion? Absolutely. And I think a lot of people would agree that Israel has lost the information more. Israel has lost the uh, per the public and the public's trust and perception. They will not recuperate from that thanks to social media, thanks to the fact that we are seeing videos from many Palestinians and people who have died, who have sent what has been happening thanks to that if it was 10 years ago it wouldn't be the same because technology has developed in a way that has allowed us to see in real time what this ethnic cleansing what this genocide is by the zionist israeli project and what what we're seeing it cannot be unseen the the bodies of children of infants of women of of everybody of men as well as as especially young people the fact that uh, palestinians died trying to get flour uh that will never be forgotten the fact that al shifa hospital a hospital was bombed into oblivion the actual incubator babies that were left and and have been found deceased and and their bones that were left the, these stories are not just, you know, stories that have been told by a third parties. We have seen them in the images every single day since October 7th. And we have also seen in a jarring way 
the lies from the State Department, the protection of Israel by uh, Israelis and, and Zionists in the United States, their complete and total fabrication of lies in an attempt to try to make themselves the victims has completely, is just entirely opposed in, in a way that it, it completely contradicts the reality. So because of that, people have lost trust in Israel. They have been questioning why our country is subservient to Israel, according to many people's beliefs. I think our country gives Israel the funding, and I don't think Israel would be what it is without our funding, without our weapons. But people have also started to say, well, why does Israel get better health care? Why does Israel uh, have the ability to, to have a better way of life than Americans do? And this is something that has made people question, why then is our money going there? Why is our money going to Ukraine? There's all of these things that people have been questioning. The fact that some a majority of our Congress has or a significant part of our Congress has dual citizenship with Israel and holds Israeli passports of a uh, state that isn't fully recognized by the by a lot of the community that is continuing to expand into the occupied West Bank, demolishing their homes and enacting apartheid on these people. And I just got back from the West Bank, and I really? got to interview people. Yeah, and and saw. Uh, what Israel is doing there. And the West Bank shouldn't be forgotten because that is another target for Israel. And there is a war going on there with the resistance fighting Israel uh, every single day and, and people getting killed just for existing and for trying to resist, basically. Um, and according to international law, Palestinians have the right to resist because Israel is an occupation. So the people that are breaking international law or the entity that is, it's Israel. And one more thing I wanna say on that uh, topic is that Israel has also actually not won militarily. It hasn't uh, completed its objectives. The resistance, the axis of resistance, which consists of Ansarala in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Iran, uh, and also the Palestinian aspect of the resistance that is beyond uh, just Hamas, there are 17 or at least other resistance factions, has continued to fight. Uh, Israel has destroyed their drones, their military equipment, and Israel has been unable to actually recuperate. They've lost many more men and troops that we have been hearing in the West. And the only thing that makes Israel look like they think like some sort of strong and mighty uh, intelligence power, uh, military intelligence power, is the fact that they've killed 33,000 plus uh, human beings, mostly uh, defenseless women and children. And that is the only thing they're using to show, look, we demolished all of Gaza. Look, we demolished Al Shifa Hospital. Look, we're bombing Rafa, the area where we told Palestinians to go for safety. And that is the only thing that they're using to show some sort of superiority, but that's not going to actually achieve their military objectives. In fact, Ansarallah has been destroying their ships and also American ships as well, and has been attacking them militarily and financially. Iran and Syria have also played a role, which is why you saw that attack on Iran's embassy in Syria. And of course, uh, that is something that Israel doesn't want people to know, that it's failed in its mission as well militarily. Yeah, and just you know, to remind people of what's going on uh, at the border of the Red Sea uh, with the Houthis. The Houthis are actually also stopping without actually harming any of the crews on the ships and making sure that these ships do not go through the Red Sea in order to transport the goods and services to Israel. So it just goes to show that there's a lot of victories on the resistance front that a lot of people aren't talking about, that people like yourself and many people are talking about as well. Uh, people like yourself, you have people like Glenn Greenwald that are talking about it as well. Um, so that's what's been going on you know, as of recently. So yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, so so much is going on, um, and you know, and I don't mean to alarm people, but with uh, respect to what happened in uh, Syria, in Damascus, and the bombing, I think there's there's going to be retaliation from Iran, as they have said, um, and I don't think it's going to be you know civilian retaliation or embassies, but it is going to be retaliation against Israel. And it, again, the United States has told Iran not to do that, but Iran's going to defend its its own. Uh, borders, its own embassy, its own security. Israel has been attacking Syria, Iran, Palestine, uh, the West Bank, Gaza, uh, targeting Yemen as well. So Israel can go around the world attacking with impunity, as well as these uh, uh, world central kitchen uh, aid workers and other, by the way, om almost 200 aid workers before that that were mostly of Palestinian origin, that the world didn't care about until Amer Americans and Australians died. By the way, the company owner is a raving Zionist and was praising Israel the entire time. So many have been saying that these workers were not even there on a humanitarian basis, were, were more so there as an intelligence uh, uh, basis. Either way, their they're, they're killings, their sacrificing, at least uh, in that sense, is, is completely wrong and it's, it shouldn't have happened. But that's what we're seeing. And now all the aid that was going to Palestine, which was very small to begin with, has been stopped. And so at the end of the day, Palestinians continue to starve and um, Israel continues acting with impunity. Yeah, and it, it's it's ridiculous what's, you know, all the destruction that has been going on. Uh, and one of the things that I actually wanted to share was, you know, in regards to the information war, even corporate media is now starting to take a bit of a heel turn, if you notice. And this is something that I found very interesting on Morning Joe. This actually happened a few days ago. I'm not sure if you saw this. But it feels like Morning Joe even is forced to take a heel turn. Not that they actually want to. And they're still trying to keep the same State Department narrative, but they're tweaking it so that it's more in line with the general consensus of those of us who are against what's going on in Gaza. And let me just share this a little bit. Mr. Minister, about the number of civilian deaths among the Gazan population. Not only that, but the famine that now has taken place because Gaza is cut off. Again, no one can test what you're saying about Hamas. We say it every day on this show and have for a very long time, especially after the hideous attack of October 7th. But is Israel concerned about the human suffering inside Gaza, number one, and the number of civilian deaths that have been incurred since this attack began? We're concerned about 134 uh, hostages. Here's a picture of some of them. These girls are under tunnels for half a year, raped, tortured, this is what we're concerned about. We're concerned about those. By the way, there is no actual evidence that any yeah. sexual assault or torture has actually happened to them. This is a claim. This There has not been any substantial evidence that has been shown that that actually happened. So therefore, this is, dare I say, at the very least spin, but at the very worst, it is an outright lie. So just want to cover that there as well. Victims in Israel that were murdered, uh, slaughtered, little children that were put in the oven. Uh, that is also a fabrication and considered a lie because there has been no evidence that children have been put inside ovens. If anything, this guy is purely projecting. Just want to put yeah. that out there so that everybody knows exactly what is going on. All right, let's continue. Women that were raped and killed while they were raped Projection. by terrorists, by jihadists. So we're concerned about those. How do we eliminate these folks? And by the way, they're funded. They're funded by Qatar and Iran. Yeah, they are. Yes, hey, they Qatar are. is a big enemy yes, of Israel. they are, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, can I ask you a question? I'm so glad you brought that up. So I have always looked at Hamas as Nazis. They're terrorists. Have you always looked at Hamas as Nazis? By the way, just for anybody watching, they also looked at somebody like Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. Yeah. And they don't look at the Azov Battalion as Nazis. They get awards. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, let's continue. Unfortunately, yes, and it was demonstrated you, October 7th what you, they do. Yeah, so, so you always have. Have most of the Israeli people always looked upon Hamas 
as Nazis? Well, you know, some of the people in Israel, because we seek peace, thought maybe one day they will prefer peace than war. October what about 7th, Benjamin that, Netanyahu? That, that, what about Benjamin Netanyahu? What, what about him? Did, did, has he always looked upon Hamas as Nazis? Well, you're talking about Qatar or Hamas? Uh, um, he said Hamas. First. <laughs> This guy is getting nervous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Hamas. 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 I think Hamas. that everyone understands that Hamas's charter is to destroy Israel. And by the way, not only so, Israel. So you've always known this. I mean, yeah. Unfortunately, we know the yes. charter. So, so, so let me ask you this question. And I can't get an answer. And maybe, maybe we're just not covering it in the press. Maybe you can help me out. Why did Benjamin Netanyahu send the head of Mossad to Doha three weeks before the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust and told Qatar to continue funding Hamas? <laughs> I'm sorry, Fiorella. <laughs> It's just hilarious because it's just like, oh, there, the, here are these people. It's like they can't necessarily say, well, you know, Hamas and then the other like 17 different resistance fighters, they're just resistance fighters. They have to say, oh, my God, they're horrible. But uh, uh, to be on the side of the people so they don't think that we're on the side of Israel. So why are they doing this? Uh, uh, why is Israel funding them? It's weird to me because it feels like, well, what you're sitting there saying that Israel's funding them, but at the same time, I don't know. Does it sound weird to you? It feels like they're, it's kind no. of like they're kind of skating on, they're riding the fence. Yeah. Because so Hamas uh, was actually in the beginning, Israel did fund Hamas because they wanted to turn Hamas against uh, their other resistance factions. But then what ended up happening is that elements of Hamas decided not to do that. Um, and you have, you know, the Al-Aqsa uh, fight that has been going on, the Alexa flood and the operations from the other resistance factions. And so a lot of people... Uh, didn't really even like Hamas uh, to begin with because they did have that funding by Israel. So I don't know if he's getting to that part, if he's saying that, you know, so why did why did Israel actually, yeah, fund Hamas to begin with? Um, and then, of course, their plan didn't work. Uh, their plan didn't work. They're not going to be honest about this, right? They're still saying, like, Hamas are Nazis, like, you know they're they're using all of this, but I think that's that's part of what he's trying to do is try to say, well, if if you think Hamas are Nazis, then why did Israel fund them? And this is kind of interesting to see because he's putting this guy in the hot seat, and he's clearly nervous, and he's clearly uh, doesn't know how to answer this question because the guy's like, yeah, I agree with you, I agree with you, Joe, right? He's like, I agree with you, I agree with you, but so why did Netanyahu? fund Hamas. This is interesting because I'm surprised MSNBC is even going this route because this is usually the route the independent media has you know, brought up to question. Yeah, and let's just go to where this guy continues. Uh, you know, he kind of fumbles because <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, it's kind of funny because it's just like, this is, is this the same channel? Let, let's go. I think, if anything, October 7 shattered that concept. And, and it, it's my understanding. But you just said you always knew they were Nazis. I always knew they were Nazis. I would never give. I, we, we were always angry that Qatar funded Hezbollah and Hamas. I want to know, why did Benjamin Netanyahu do that? Let me ask you this. Why did Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump know in 2018 the sources of Hamas's illicit funding and they still did nothing? They wanted that money to get to Hamas. I'd like to know why, because we don't know in America. Is, are, have there been any investigations in Israel at this point? 
I'm sure we'll investigate it, and I totally agree. I'm sure we'll investigate it. I'm sure. Fiorella, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. And, and that goes, that's a 10-minute clip. He goes on just grilling him about, why are you guys doing this if they're supposedly your enemy? And this makes me go back to how people like Osama bin Laden was actually trained by the CIA, and then he turns around and actually does what he does on 9-11 because of what the United States and Israel have been doing to Palestine. And in his letter to the United States, he actually states that we did this because of what you guys are doing to Palestine. Now, I'm not saying that we agree with what he did because essentially what Osama bin Laden did was collective punishment, which we don't agree with. But at the same time, it's like we understand that his ire, his anger towards the United States turned because even though he was a tool at first, he switched sides. Yeah, which happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just interesting how even Morning Joe has to kind of wrestle with the fact that the people in this country do not like what's going on. And so now they kind of have to ride that fence a little bit. Uh, and yeah. so there is um, something else I, I wanted to share as well. This actually came out earlier today, I think it was. Uh, shout out to the RBN uh, Orlando chapter. They actually shared this as well with me. But this is out of Spelman College. Uh, students in Spelman College are actually protesting against a Biden official. Will you call for your mom, Butcher Biden, to stop arming Israel? There's no discussion. It's a yes or no. Will you help put it into the genocide? Is it a genocide or a conflict? I just want to know. <laughs> because according to international law, there is a correct answer. Nobody should be sitting on stage with her while she's promoting genocide. She lacks moral courage. None of us here is black world. You spoke about the involvement of the Israel lobby in the U.S. politics, and now you're a part of it. <laughs> How do you feel about uh, gaslighting black students? Simply, just how do you feel gaslighting black students? And these are not just students. We have alums in the audience who watch you all. We call on all historically black college campuses to not allow us to be used. Even if our own professor wanted to be used, we will not be complicit in genocide. The answer is simple. As a black woman that is walking the same alley as Alex walked in this walk, I could not stay silent during the genocide. Shame on you, both of you, your discussion for a remote future. Shame on you for allowing black folks to be kicked out of college. Calling security on your black students, huh? Shame! Shame! Shame on Were you on stage whispering about how you think hospitals are military targets, or were you just key king because you don't care about human lives? Palestinians deserve better, black people deserve better, and Selma needs to do better. My sister will not let them make a fool. And she finishes by saying, make them let up, make a fool out of you. They did. They absolutely did. I love that. I love that. Good job, guys. Yeah. Whoever did and, that. Awesome. Well, that goes into basically what you were saying about how, and, and I just wanted to ask, what is the severity of the loss of the information war by Israel in, in, in your view? Well, it's, it's that uh, it's going to build. It's going to get increasingly um, more uh, serious for Israel. 
because Israel will not have the support, even of the once diplomatic powers. I just uh, earlier talked about this. The uh, Russian and, and Chinese uh, have been extremely diplomatic with Israel. Uh, they have advocated the 1967 borders with uh, from the UN Charter, the uh, two-state solution. They have advocated that Israel, uh, it, you know, there should be an Israeli state and a Palestinian state. They, uh, specifically Russia, has remained the attempted neutral party to try to keep the region uh, in peace. Russia is a strong ally of Iran. Russia is a strong ally of Syria. Syria and Russia are fighting uh, against al-Qaeda factions in Syria right now. The Syrian Arab army is fighting these moderate rebels um, that were funded and supported by the United States. And... Uh, that is what what uh, that connection with Russia is a very substantial one. But simultaneously, you had a population a long time ago that's existed and continues today of Russian Jews. So you have uh, a lot of Russian Jews living in Israel. You have the fact that Russia is a multi-ethnic state that has uh, Jews, uh, uh, Muslims, the Chechens are the famously... Uh, known Muslims of Russia, and you have all of these different factions living in Russia. So what happens now, because Israel has become so entirely, uh, it can't help itself, in, in, in October 7th and what it's done to Gaza after that really destroyed Israel. It's, it's self-destroyed. Netanyahu is no longer popular with any of his constituents. They are, they are protesting him every single day. And he's yeah. not popular with the rest of the world either. He's looked down as a demon that is uh, actually doing genocide and killing innocents all over, the, uh, all over Gaza. And you cannot have a, a relationship. Nobody's going to stand with that on, on an international level besides the United States who needs Israel and perhaps uh, the UK who also, ha of course, create, helped create Israel and also, in a way, uses Israel. You're not going to have anybody else, though, besides those to actually stand with Israel. And so when you're looking at it from a diplomatic sense, this bombing of the Iranian embassy, which is, again, it's just, it hasn't happened. Uh, this is, these are countries it, like uh, China and Russia, they, they look at everything diplomatically, and this is something they cannot stand by. They have ardently criticized Israel, and you're going to see a shift in their relationship with Israel. Israel is becoming more isolated, more alone, and it's it's going to be, I think, isolated. Nobody's going to want to bring in Israel as some sort of actual legitimate entity when they're doing what they're doing. And it's going to become increasingly unpopular to do so. We see what Nicaragua is doing. Uh, again, we've seen what South Africa has done. We're going to see more and more. Of course, this is happening coming from the global south, right? Uh, Latin America, the, uh, the continent of Africa, and and such because they have been, of course, on the uh, receiving end of Western hegemony and colonialism. So they understand exactly what Israel is. So, of course, they are going to be the ones leading this charge. But then you also have big superpowers like Russia and China that had a relationship with Israel. You're going to see that relationship shift as Iran uh, and the situation with Iran heats up. They're, they're going to have to make a decision and they're not going to side with the United States' biggest ally in Israel. They're going to have to make a decision. And you can see the alignments happening right now. If there was to be a world war, this is a world war that the United States and the West, including NATO, cannot win. We're talking about Iran's nuclear and military capabilities that far supersede um, much of what the U Europe has, including elements of the U.S., Russia has capabilities that far exceed what the United States has. China as well. You can't, there's no way. And this is not something I would want. But this is this is where we're headed because of the push by our own government. The, the Pentagon, the State Department, they're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And these countries, these people have been extremely, had a lot of restraint, if I do say so myself, uh, the way Russia was attacked in a terrorist attack, 
uh, the way that China's red lines were crossed with the United States doing military drills in ta with Taiwan. And and you're also seeing Iran. It, it's it's Qasem Soleimani was killed during the Trump administration in 2020. And now another general was killed and, and six others were killed. And they still, you know, they're still going to show restraint, but they're going to act. And I think what we're seeing is that both Israel and the United States as its main uh, funder are not going to be looked at the same again. And, and this is going to be also coming from the youth, the youth that has now learned what the Nakba was, the 1948 Nakba, and how it relates to now. The videos we have seen on TikTok and Instagram and everybody just saying, what the hell? We don't want to stand by this. We don't want our taxpayer dollars to go to this. Once you question something like this in, in your lifetime, once you find out what your government is capable of, you're going to start looking into everything else. And that's where we in independent media and in media have to go and continue providing this uh, knowledge and, and journalism and analysis and to make sure that this continues to become public knowledge. Because I think the people in the United States, we are the only ones that can actually help stop a, a global war of sorts because it is from our own uh, country, our own government that it, it's really coming from. You stop the funding to Israel, you end Israel. You you really do. You stop the funding to Israel, Israel becomes essentially powerless. They will yeah. not be able to keep up. You stop the funding to Ukraine, the war in Ukraine ends. You stop the, the engagements from the United States uh, on China and trying to stoke this war with China. Uh, you know, wrapped up as 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 this war against communism. Here we are again. You know, more than seventy years later, we're seeing the the, the new the Cold War that never ended. And so you stop all of that. You you have peace. You have all of these other countries that want to cooperate. BRICS. You have this this idea of of existing cooperatively, of respecting people's sovereignty. You may disagree with how other countries conduct their affairs, but you discuss it diplomatically. That's a new paradigm that people are trying to go towards. That states, and especially in the East and Global South, are trying to go towards. But the United States and Israel, essentially, and NATO, stand in the way of that. And one side is is right now falling, and it's like a beast that is just latching on and it's trying so hard and desperately to continue to win uh, and to stay in power um, in, in a moment where it's it's basically already lost. It, it's, it's not going to, we are not going to go back to the unilateral hold that the United States and NATO had. It's just not going to happen anymore. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and just to add one thing, I, I personally wish that China was a little bit more forceful and as forceful yeah. Yeah. as say Nicaragua, uh, yeah. there was a, um, there was a move by the Irish Senate to, uh, to also, uh, sanction Israel, uh, to, and then Julius Malema of South Africa wanted to pull, wanted to close the, the embassy, the Israeli embassy. Uh, just wanted them to pull away completely. I wish China was more forceful in that as well. That's just my opinion, though. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah. Um, I do have a question that was proposed by a, a viewer. I, you know, I just want to preface this by saying, you know, I wouldn't have done it in all caps, <laughs> but... Uh, this person wanted to know uh, your thoughts about the attack of Ecuador to the Mexican embassy. I'm not exactly sure if you have already spoke about that, but uh, what is your thoughts? I'm not as up to speed on it as of yet as I should be, I but... Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly I haven't um, been like super detailed about it, but what I do know it is an entire violation of of the sovereign right of the Mexican people. And I think AMLO is correct in saying that this is absolutely ridiculous. And again, Israel has led the way. The United States has also uh, violated international law before. This isn't the first time. Um, we're talking about attacking embassies. The United States has led the way. Now Israel, of course, bombed an entire embassy. So now it's a free-for-all, right? We can just attack uh, diplomatic uh, areas, consulates that are supposed to yeah. be free of 
all of this, right? And and now it's it's started this this trend, and I, it's completely awful, and it shouldn't happen. And the uh, Mexican people have a right to be upset; they have a right to be pissed off, and this should be talked about uh, extensively at the UN, although we know that the UN, in my opinion, is just completely needs entire reform or needs to be completely something else because all of these international organizations have shown their cowardice and have shown their inability to actually do what is needed in this time of urgency where we're talking about a genocide we don't need is to give israel a slap on the wrist we don't need to give israel 30 more days we just need to give israel you know uh, condemnation and they need to be economically and militarily restricted when we talk about bds that's the only way to stop israel that that really is uh, the only way you're not going to have um you know anything else and you're not going to have a two state solution a lot of people act like this is the most a viable thing that this is realistic. It's actually unrealistic at this point to have a two-state solution. When you see the videos of Israelis of how they feel about Palestinians behind Netanyahu, there's so many, so many people that feel the same way and, um, and many worse than Netanyahu, if you can imagine that. And it's not going to change. This is like you go back to apartheid Africa. This isn't going to go away overnight. There needs to be a forceful uh, Palestinian state established that exists with both people that is that is not allowed, uh, is going to allow Israel to expand. Because Israel has said they are going to expand into Jordan, into Lebanon, into Syria. They want all of this territory. And they have been honest about them wanting. They think it's their god-given right to do so it's this yeah. zionist idea that they're using to to expand and um when i was in the west bank uh, that is one of the things they are doing and um th that is something that's not going to stop there's also thousands of palestinians in israeli prison including children and they don't get trials they're not given anything and they also don't get slogans like release the hostages because they're posed as being terrorists for resisting the uh, Zionist uh, entity. So again, the, what we're talking about here is a lack of respect to national sovereignty, a lack of respect yeah. to people who who are are you know basically trying to run their own affairs. And on that note, I will say that I will be following the Mexican election coming up because uh, AMLO will be leaving. And uh, it is a scary time because he will not be, there's a limit in Mexico. And so he will, he didn't change anything uh, in terms of that. So he will not be reelected uh, this time around. So there will be another president. And that is a potentially uh, dangerous election because the United States, of course, has been very uh, uh just vindictive when it comes to Mexico, trying to say that the cartels are all just coming from Mexico and trying to impose itself on Mexico's affairs. Also, the economies are severely tied. So that'll be an election as well to look at. And I also, in respect to what just happened in Ecuador, that'll be something also to look into. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for answering that question. And, and I just wanted to ask as far as, because I know you're on RT, uh, you have a lot of irons in the fire that are going on right now. Uh, yeah. Is there anything new that's going on with you that you're excited, any new projects that are going on new with you that we need to be uh, up to speed about? Yeah, so I will be doing a few new projects and I'll inform people when I, I have that. But right now I have a new channel called Fiorella in Moscow where I'm putting up uh, new content, new interviews, and also about Russia and life in Russia as well. Um, and I also uh, just went to the West Bank. I have some interviews that I'll be releasing this week and next week um, with interviews from mothers who have children in prison who have been sentenced there for at least five years. They keep uh, just, there's no reason. They just, they don't have a trial. They keep pushing it back. There's also a mother who lost her son who was a resistance fighter. And I went to the site where um, Shireen Abu Akhle was murdered as well. And uh, that that's uh, in Janine. Uh, in the in the occupied West Bank, and I uh, talked to these people there. I also talked to some refugees from Gaza that are in the West Bank and what their fears are. So be lo be looking out for these interviews 
and um, you know, subsequent perhaps articles on on this as well. And um, I also recently went to Lugansk uh, in the Donbass, uh, and I will have more information on that as I'll be returning very soon. So there's a lot going on. Be uh, sure to check out my uh, Twitter and also my um, YouTube as well. Today I interviewed Vanessa Beely and Eva Bartlett, and they were uh, they have both lived in Syria and Gaza and uh, know extensively about the region. So yeah, just be sure to check that out. Oh, sucky, sucky. Now I'm excited for you. Good to see that. I'm so happy for you. And Thank also, you. yeah, it's great because the thing is, I think that a lot of people need to see more of this perspective uh, outside of just the, the Western narrative. And you've been doing really well in this and, and, and pushing this out. But I think also showing that, oh, uh, this is what life really like is in places like Moscow, or this is what's going on in the West Bank. I think that's important, especially, you know, when people like us say, yeah, there's apartheid that's going on there. And people are like, there's no apartheid. Like Michael Rappaport goes, where's the apartheid at? And you're like, ha ha, here it is. There it is right there. I think that's so important. Yeah, it's it's important. A lot of people just don't know. And that's what we try to do is to inform them, you know, that this, th what you've been told is the lie. And it's hard to tell people that, that they've been lied to. So, uh, yeah, but that's why we need programs like yours and others. And um, thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you so much. And just to let everybody know, uh, I'm going to share with you guys Fiorella's uh, Twitter account. If you guys would like to, you guys can also follow her there. She uh, also puts out really great content, really great breaking stories. Uh, I try to share whenever I can. Of course, you know, we get throttled on Twitter, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nature of the Beast. Like, Elon likes to talk about how he's a free speech, spe free speech absolutist. But yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the call is coming, coming inside the house, Elon. So, but yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's what they can find you there as well as you're on RT, correct? Yeah, I'm on RT as well. But um, right now I'm, I'm really focused on my uh, projects and my work. So I'll be looking out for a lot of online stuff as well. All right. Thank you so much for joining. It was such a pleasure to have you again. And, you know, you. I learned a lot from you. And so I felt like I was a student, you know, and you were a <laughs> professor just giving me knowledge about what's going on in the world and i just i'm humbled and thank you so much thank you and i appreciate your attention to the domestic issues too because those are important and directly affected of course by our foreign policy so thank you for that thank you so much i'll see you again soon okay bye all right bye-bye thank you so very much for watching my channel and i deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart if you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. More head kisses and have a beautiful day.